Thank you. This lecture is about chemical safety. The consulting Rosarians who sign in on the sheet of paper that is in the back will be awarded one point towards their CR commitment. And I hope that you look at the status page on the district website to see where you are, what you owe, what you did, if you are up to date on your ARS membership, et cetera. And I hope you're also keeping track of your own points because everyone is human, everyone is fallible, and if you're depending on people at headquarters or people at the district home of the person keeping points, you're in peril. I mean, these people also have lives, so keep track of your points and be able to argue if you have to. Of course, when I was CR chair, that didn't work, but Greg is nicer. Okay, let's see if we can go. Here's the basics. For pest control, we practice integrated pest management, whether we call it that or not. IPM is a system of choice. You're going to do something, even if you decide to do nothing. That is an action or a non-action. You will choose it. The basic elements of IPM, you have to make a decision on whether you're going to do anything. You have to make a decision about when you're going to do this. You have to make a decision about how you're going to do this. And then after it's all over, you have to decide, did it work? Was it the right thing? Will I ever do something like that again? It's all about choice. At one extreme, you'll find an, an avid gardener, as we call them, who will quickly decide that they're going to spray and eliminate everything. I mean, a toxic cloud hangs over their garden at all times. On the other extreme, you'll find an avid gardener who's absolutely against absolutely everything. I will not spray. Let them do what they do. God's creatures must survive. And that's a choice. That was their choice. They live with their own choice. They are both practicing IPM. They're managing their garden according to their own gardening philosophy. And it's not up to you or me to try to change their mind, to try to tell them they're wrong, to try to tell them don't do it that way. That's not the way it's done, says here in the book. That's their choice. All you can do is teach if someone asks Hold a seminar, give a lecture, demonstrate something, bring in your beautiful roses that were grown the way you grow them, and publicly say, I grew this rose, it became queen of show, and I haven't sprayed in five years except for horticultural oil, or sulfur in water, or whatever you do. Talk about it. Demonstrate the success of what you do based on what you've decided. That's IPM. It's a big dilemma out in the world because organic happens to be a marketing term. I'm a chemist. To me, organic means the molecule I'm working with has a carbon atom somewhere in the chain. And that's all it means. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's not a gardening practice. Green is a gardening practice. Sustainable is a gardening practice. Not organic. Please don't get caught up in that argument because, boy, they can really chew you up. The spray materials can be natural, made by Mother Nature, like sulfur. It's a mineral. They can be manufactured in a laboratory, synthetic, synthetic copies of natural minerals. They just made it in two weeks instead of 25,000 years. Pests don't care what you use. They're either going to live or die. Just remember, when, when someone is giving you the O argument, everything is made of chemicals, including you. Me, the cat and dog, tables, chairs, roses, it's all chemicals. 
Just know how to use them correctly and what you're using. Here's the type of garden chemicals that we deal with. Pesticides. Definition of a pesticide is any substance or mixture of substances that is intended to be used to prevent, destroy, repel, or mitigate, get rid of, stop them, anything that you consider a pest. Try not to extend that definition to your next door neighbors. No, no, no. Pesticide means kills pest, whatever the pest is. Could be a dandelion. No, Lynette. Insecticides, a special category of pesticide that kills insects. Insects have six legs, sometimes wings, sometimes not. Bugs in the vernacular. Fungicides, kill funguses, or the plural is appropriately fungi. Miticides, also called acaricides, the Greek word for it, they kill mites. Mites are very, very, very small. You won't usually see them because at our age, your eyes aren't that good. But they're little teeny tiny things and they have eight legs, but they're not spiders. They're mites, okay? Herbicides, kills green things. Herb, kills plants, in other words. Kills your flowers, kills weeds, kills rose bushes, herbicide. Sprayed on county verges, that's where the fence line is along the road. And uh, it can drift over into your garden or your field if you're not careful. Rodenticide kills rodents, okay? And I used to make the joke, homicide kills humans, yes. Those are all pesticides. Now, when used in a CR school, the red Words will show up on the test. You're not taking a test today, so just notice the ones in red. First line of defense, how do I know what to buy? Read the labels. Go to the store and read the labels. How do I know when to apply it? Read the label. How long can I have it on the shelf? Read the label. How do I use it? Read the label. Yes, it's the recipe book. Read the label. What can the label tell you? It'll tell you the brand name, whether Ortho made it, or Bayer made it, or, uh, yeah, Scott's, good one, because you just saved my life. It went right out. Okay, it can tell you where it should be used and what for. It's, I'm walking out of the frame, John, ready? It says, B, it controls insects on home lawns, flowers, vegetables, trees, and shrubs. Where? On lawns. For what? Insects. Why? For flowers and vegetables and trees and shrubs. It's on the label. It'll tell you the specific pest it's made to control. It will tell you the ingredients in there that are toxic to the pest. And remember, in all of these lectures you've had, it's just a smidgen of active ingredient in a container full of filler material that actually is in there to make it work. So it won't clot, dry up, um, change its chemical character until its use life is over. Carriers, in other words. Okay, it will give you information on the manufacturer. It will give you the signal word. You remember the signal words. Caution, warning, and danger. They're on every single label. There are two cautions but they won't differentiate. They won't say caution A, caution B. It just says caution. Okay. It will tell you the EPA registration number, which is a good idea to have on hand in case uh, somebody overdoses on the pesticide and you have to call the doctor. Uh, 
the Poison Control Center would also love to have that. You want to sit over here? Cool. Okay. It will uh, tell you the amount that's in the container. Eight ounces, one gallon. It will also, on the back of the label or on the little folding tablet thing that they put in there, it'll tell you if there are hazards to humans or domestic animals, don't use near ponds, which means it'll kill your goldfish or your carp or your koi or your frogs, etc. It will tell you the first aid procedures. Wash your eyes immediately. Okay, it also tells you potential hazards to the wildlife and the environment. In other words, don't let it slop over into the edge of the national forest that you're backed up on because Bambi eats the grass over there. Okay, it will advise you about the protective clothing you should wear, and we'll get into that a little. It'll give you the legal warning, which basically says you got to do it the way the label says because that's the law. If you don't do it the way the label says and you get into trouble, that's your problem. It will void your insurance. It will put you in jail. It will blah, blah. The label is the law. Do it the way the label says. It will tell you how to mix it and how to use it. It will tell you how to store it and how to get rid of it when you're through with it. It will tell you to peel the label open and there's even more information in there. And then it really gets into agricultural things. And except for a few of us, that's very boring. Okay, if you're going to use <coughs> any kind of a product on anything, Alice, I'm going to need a glass of water. Read the label, follow the directions every single time. It doesn't matter if you use this stuff once a month, once every quarter, once a year. Every time you're going to use it, read the label again because you're not going to remember correctly. And it only takes one mistake and you either burn up your roses or you create a race of superhuman bugs that will eat the neighborhood, etc. Let's, you know, don't fool around. Read the label. Doesn't take that much time. And if the snails ate your label, maybe it's time to go buy a new container of this stuff. You know? Maybe. Okay. It, um, if you're going to use it, store it in the original container locked away so that kids can't get into it and pets can't get into it. And I'll tell you, in my garage where my pesticide locker is, possums got in my garage a couple of years ago, and some of you have heard me tell the story. Uh, one of them knocked over a bottle of Peter's 2020-20, which is a blue liquid fertilizer, uh-huh. And my garage is now decoupaged with possum tracks in blue and purple all over the floor, up and down the shelving, on boxes and barrels, and uh, it's not attractive. <laughs> so lock it up where pets and other animals can't get to it, and definitely not kids. We don't want to hear any stories about the child who was home alone, opened the cabinet, and drank a bottle of lye or something like that. Let's not do that. Don't mix the ingredients. If you've got bottle A and bottle B and you say, oh, I could use some of that and some of that, and then I only have to do this one time, read the labels. Unless the label says this can be used with that, don't do it. Mixing chemicals is kind of like, you know, in the lab where they made Frankenstein's monster and the reactor is going bloop, 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 and the green bubbles are going up and down. Sometimes when you mix things, you get a mess. Thank you, Alice. Yeah. Yes, Charlie. Does that include fertilizers? Does that include fertilizers? It could if they're liquid, okay? But we're talking not fertilizers although a lot of it slops over and applies because we put things in our fertilizer too. Uh, I <laughs> One of the things you should do is check the use by date. 
if it's out of date, if it's old, uh, not only will it not work right because chemicals do age, but chances are it has separated. So you've got a layer of oily stuff at the top and solid stuff at the bottom and an unknown in the middle. And even if you try to shake it up, you're not going to be able to mix it well in a minute, Lenore. Um, I made that mistake. I've done it several times, and I should know better. But in my sprayer, I put some stuff that was too old, added the water, went to spray, and in the time it took to add the water and shake the thing up and then decide to spray, I had flocculent. Okay, that's a nice chemistry term, which meant that it looked like there was a miniature snowstorm going on inside as these little waxy flakes were floating down through a clear solution at the top, and the sludge at the bottom had little, like, pearl onions in it already. Yeah, and it was too late because I'd gone like this with my spray handle, so the nozzle died, the entire wand was plugged. It was the yuckiest. I tried to clean it up. I really tried to clean it up. I bought a new sprayer. Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask if that included spray oils. Spray oils? Which part? I can't see the wall. You can't see it? Okay. Uh, do not mix the separate ingredients unless the label says. If the label says it's okay to add, a, add an oil. I mean an oil. Oh, no, an oil doesn't consolidate, but it can fractionate. It can separate. I mean, think of making gasoline from crude oil. I mean, that's a, a real stretch, but it can happen. Yeah. Ask Mary Lou. She didn't always have that hairdo. <laughs> if it's old, get some new stuff. And don't share it. Don't pour some out into another bottle or container and, and give it to Charles or give it to Rose because it's really great stuff and you can't buy it anymore. So here you go. Uh-uh. First of all, it's against the law. Second, what about the label? That little container doesn't have the label on it and that's a law. You have to have the label. And what if you say, oh, I think you use um, two tablespoons to a gallon, I think. Ah. Uh. I wouldn't trust that. Not I think. Uh-uh. If you want to share it, you bought a gallon of it, and you've only used less than a quart, but Rosemary would like to use it, and she doesn't want to go buy a full gallon, and you say, I've got one. Have her come over and borrow the whole gallon, mix it at her house, spray, bring the gallon back. That way, she uses some, she reads the label, she knows how to mix it and to apply it, etc. That's how you can share, but never pouring it out, etc., etc. Okay. Uh, know the number for the Poison Control Center. It's very important uh, because if something really bad happens and you have to call them, you're going to do this just straight without having to look it up. It's a very easy one. Uh, we'll get to the last thing in a minute. Poison Control Center. So 1 800 222 1222. There's a one in the middle. That's the national. You tell them where you are, where you live, what happened. Have that EPA number if possible. If not, have the original container with the label so you can tell them what the active ingredient is and the percent of active ingredient that is in there. Definitely tell them what happened. If the person that has the problem is not you and you're reporting you found a body on the sidewalk, uh, if they are collapsed and can't talk to you or if they're not breathing, it's 911. Forget the Poison Control Center. You know, it's too late for their help. Poison Control Center is going to tell you how to mitigate what you've done, which means try to fix it. <coughs> Hopefully, you can fix it. Okay, again, the number for the Poison Control Center is 1 800 2221222. Very easy to remember. This is how pesticides can enter your body. The first cartoon is dermal. 
there's these little black dots raining down on him. It's, it's a mist, and it's touching his skin. He's walking through a mist of whatever. Something was atomized, and he's getting it all over himself. That's dermal. The second one shows a cartoon fellow drinking it. I haven't heard of that since West Noyle parties, but I'm sure it can happen. Um, usually, oral, oral is what they're talking about, means you'll have a glass of something, and you're mixing. Some of it got in there by vapor or otherwise, and then you take a drink. Or you're smoking a cigarette, and it got on the cigarette. Or you're chewing gum, your mouth is going, and it flies in that way, or whatever. Be aware, oral is another way of getting pesticide inside of you. The third cartoon says uh, respiratory, going into the lungs. You breathed it in. Well, I could tell you you're not supposed to breathe while you're mixing these things. <laughs> but reflexes will kick in, you know, so you are going to breathe. Might be a good idea if you had a mask of some kind so you don't breathe the stuff. Yeah, and we'll see that a little later. And the last one says, I can't read it. Ocular, okay, splashed in the eyes. Think about this, you've got eyelids. They're flaps of skin. If you close your eyes over, your eyes are closed. If you open your eyes, your eyeballs do skin. No, no skin on your eyeballs. Uh-uh, you splash something in your eyes and that's direct contact with cornea, iris, muscular bodies, and the mucous membrane covering the scleroderma. And it can be very dangerous. We all remember in the good old days when we could still buy Funginex, and I'm sure the couple from Reno can still buy it, but we can't. Uh, Funginex has a danger signal word. Not because Funginex is gonna hurt you, it won't, but the carrier that is used to keep it in liquid solution is very dangerous to mucous membranes, which is what is covering your eye. So ocular is another way of getting a pesticide into you. What? Injection. Oh, God. Anne Marie, I don't even want to put a picture like that up. <laughs> yeah, people do inject. Oh. Well, they'll inject chemicals, yes. Yeah, they'll inject chemicals, which, you know, if it kills them, it's a pesticide. It has removed them anyway. You know the chemicals we're talking about. Yeah, okay. So again, how did that get into your body? Oral, it's a mistake. You got it in your mouth when you were eating or smoking while you were mixing it, during, after spraying, whatever, it somehow got into your mouth. That's, hmm? While drinking. Drinking. Um, dermal. <coughs> How did it get into you? It came in through your skin. This is the most common form of pesticide poisoning because you got a lot of skin all over your body except your eyes. Skin, any little bit, vapor or otherwise, that gets on your skin can be absorbed through your skin. Think about when you take a shower, you stay in there too long, excuse me, you start getting wrinkled, and we all know from eighth grade chemistry that that's osmosis, and it's a balance that nature is trying to create to make your inside of your body and your outside of body have the same amount of moisture on it and it doesn't work. So you're getting all wrinkled because you're losing moisture. Okay. The most common cause of pesticide poisoning, it gets through your skin. If you splash it on your shoulder, on your back, thighs, it can be absorbed. If you splash it on your hands, it's going to go in way faster. If you splash it on the palms of your hands, even more faster. More faster is a great word. Yeah, 
there are parts of your body that will absorb these things faster. So don't splash it on you. Hmm? Wear throwaway gloves. Yeah, we're going to get to the protective covering. Uh, you're in charge of making sure I don't kick that, okay? All right. Okay, it's very, very, pesticides are very, very dangerous in their concentrated form. But that's the cheapest way to buy them. You know, you buy a bottle of the concentrate and then you mix it with water so that you don't have to buy the big jug that'll only last a little while. It's already pre-mixed. But concentrates are dangerous, especially because you will splash them on you because you have to mix. Okay. Inhalation. You're going to breathe the vapors when you're mixing things, putting it in here, putting it in there. Ideally, you would do this just like my lab with a fume hood going so that all vapors are going that way away from me, but we don't live in an ideal world. You're going to do this in your garage or out on your patio table or crouched down on the brickwork outside where the fuchsia is growing, wherever you're mixing this stuff and you're hovering over it and inevitably, if you can smell it, you know you've already breathed it in. You know, it's just that easy. So again, maybe you want to put something over you. Might be a good idea. And into the eyes. This isn't mentioned in the CR manual, but some pesticides can cause permanent eye damage. And that is on the label of the ones that can do that. So be aware of it. Wear glasses, safety glasses, where splashes can't get to your eyes. Okay, how bad is this stuff? What is this toxicity that we're talking about? Toxicity means how poisonous is it? How bad is it? And it is measured by an LD50. LD means lethal dose. And the 50 is 50%. 50 now, here's how they calculate that. Whatever the ingredient is that they're testing, they will have, pretend, 100 subjects, white mice, rats, whatever they're using, and they'll give it to them. If they're testing dermal, they'll smear it on their skin. If it's inhalation, they'll let them breathe it, you know, da-da-da-da-da-da. They'll test it on 100 of these animals. And they know exactly how much they put on each animal and they have a time period to wait to see whether any of them are going to die. And they will slowly increase the dose until at least 50% of them die. That's the dose right there. That's the LD50. That's what they're looking for. A lot of this research is done outside of this country, thank God, but we do still have stuff like this going on, especially in the cosmetics industry because they have to test it on someone and humans aren't volunteering. So we've got bad stuff going on in our country too. But that's how they come up with the LD50. And the lower that number is, if you find something with an LD50 of 10, that means it's incredibly lethal because it's in milligrams show you about these milligrams. The lethal dose kills 50%. The lower the number, the more poisonous. That number is expressed in milligrams of the material per kilogram of the body weight of the victim. So, say you've got a two kilo rat. That's a big rat. It's <laughs> a big rat. But you could have one. He's been eating this stuff, you know, and he mutated. Okay, so you got a big rat, and if it only takes a couple of drops and he's going to conk out, that stuff is really poisonous. That's how it works. The lower the amount that will cause the death, the more poisonous it is. So, usually you don't find the LD50 on the label, but 
you will find the signal word, which will let you know that you're dealing with danger, which is the bad stuff, warning, which is it's getting towards the bad stuff, and the two cautions, which means eh, eh. we'll see. Okay, the signal word is based on oral, dermal, or inhalation, whichever one killed the animal first, because they'll do all the tests. They'll take the one that, that happened first. One ounce is the equivalent of 28,349 milligrams and change. One ounce. One ounce is almost 30,000 milligrams. So when you see something in 10 milligrams, 25, that's a drop from a dropper. Here's some stuff that you guys handle practically every day and the LD50 on them. Carbaryl, which is the active ingredient in seven, it's LD50 is 307. That's, that's uh, a warning, basically. DDT, its LD50 is only 87, much more poisonous. Malathion, it's 885. Methoprene, that's the stuff that's used in uh, flea collars. That's, uh, oh, 34,600. That's a low caution, okay? Nicotine sulfate, it's 50 to 60 milligrams. That's bad stuff. Yeah. Pyrethrum, 200. Rotenone, rat poison, 132. Sugar, 29,700. <laughs> copper, people, people will tell you, uh, don't breathe metallic copper, you know, it's bad for you. Well, I'm sure it is, but it's only 6,400. It's bad for you because it's part particulate matter that will lodge in your lungs, not that it's trying to poison you so much. Okay, caffeine, 192. There goes my morning coffee. Oh, man. Okay. Insecticidal soaps, between 5,000 and 10,000. Innocuous, practically. Sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, 4,220. Salt, 3,000. Hmm. We always knew salt was bad for you. It's, it's way better than sugar. Hmm. Boric acid crystals, 3,200. So which one on this list is the most lethal? You think? It's nicotine. Nicotine is the most lethal of these, of these that are listed. And yet, one of the most popular pesticide sprays when I first started rose gardening was black leaf 40, which was 40% nicotine sulfate, 40%. And we were breathing that. Is nicotinamide the same thing or is it a different compound? Nicotinamide. Nicotinamide is an uh, analyte of nicotine. You'd have to get into the chemistry, but it's been treated with nitrites and uh, it does different things, but its base is the nicotine molecule. So effectively it could be in the same category? Effectively. You could, any product that contains it, you can look it up on um, MSDS and see where it, where it ranges. The point being made was uh, when you're spraying, et cetera, et cetera, you shouldn't be smoking. You shouldn't be smoking anyway. Most of us have quit smoking. Some of us still smoke or have started again, but this is a picture of that old bottle of Blackleaf 40. Just to let you know, it's really bad stuff. Don't use it. If it's still in the garage, not only is it outdated, but it's illegal. So you need to dispose of it properly. We'll get to how to do that too. <laughs> no, it sure doesn't. It doesn't. 
and yet you can still get really good advice on the internet on how to get rid of uh, white flies and stuff like that if you just get the stub end of a cigar and put it in hot water and set it in the sun for three days and then shake it up and use that to spray, those flies will just drop over. I'll bet they will too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, one of the least toxic pesticides is insecticidal soap. Why is it a pesticide? Because these kind of soaps are fatty acids. They feel a little greasy, so we call them a soap. They will gum up the works of <coughs> insects. Insects don't have a nose. They breathe through holes down the side of their neck, or what we would call their neck. That gums up, they can't breathe. There are other places on their body that intakes gases and exits byproducts, gum that up, they can't live. So soaps will kill soft-bodied insects. Now with hard coverings like beetle wings and stuff like that, it's a little bit tougher. But a soft-bodied insect, that's an aphid. Yeah. Or mites, they're soft-bodied. Yeah. So this is a good one for that particular. Okay? You got to hit the bug. Uh, inviting them over to walk through it is, is not going to work. They, they don't take invitations kindly. But if you hit them with it, it's just as good as hosing them off with water. And the water's cheaper than buying a bottle of insecticidal soap. But with water rationing, you might want to consider the alternative. <laughs> Who knows? Yep. OK. Here's some that have danger uh, on. The label, I'm moving out of frame, John. This is Fysan. It's used for downy mildew. That's Rose Pride Disease Control. And the reason it has danger is it has um, Funginex in it. And so the carrier is in there. OK, then there's Orthofunginex. Got a picture of an old bottle of that. Same thing, danger. And then the dormant disease control also has a chemical in it that has a bad carrier. So they're all danger. <coughs> Here's some with warning. Malathion, used for flying and soft-bodied insects. Pretty good with moths and stuff like that. Um, Monterey's flowable fungicide. I have no idea what's in there because I can't read that. Dacanil and Banner Max. Banner Max you cannot get in California, but the ingredient that's in Banner Max is in, uh, what is it, Cl uh, Cleary's, which you can get in California. So read labels, read labels, read labels. And remember, the label will say that this is for ornamentals. A rose is an ornamental. Sometimes it won't list the rose specifically, but it'll say ornamentals. Roses are ornamentals. So if it's listed for ornamentals, for spot diseases, mildews, smuts, etc., and it's got the ingredient that you're shopping for, you can buy that. Okay? Ornamentals. It's legal. Doesn't have to have a rose on the label either. Some of this stuff is for tomatoes, and it works really fine. Yes? So what's the half-life of these? I mean, if you spray your roses with them, and then, you know, a week later you go and you stick your nose in the rose to smell it. <laughs> Once it dries, you're not going to be able to inhale it, and it won't get on your skin, and it's not going to splash in your eyes. Once it dries, it takes, what, an hour to an hour and a half to dry? That's why we tell you don't spray these things on a rainy, misty day. And we also say try to do it in the morning so it's got all day to dry. Don't let your pet run through the bushes until it's dry. And I usually say not that your pet is going to get ill from whatever you're spraying with, but they're going to drag it in the house and roll on your carpet and jump on the sofa. Yes? Absolutely. That'll be up 
coming up too. Okay. Um, some with a caution signal word. These are the least lethal. Uh, Bayer's all in one. Spectricide, seven. And um, Bayer's advanced garden disease control. All just with caution. Very low toxicity. Now, handling these things, if you're going to use them, Try to buy only what you need for one season because these do go out of date. The chemicals inside the can, bottle, box cannot stay fresh forever. Uh, the manufacturer has done their best to keep them fresh for a long time, but it can't be year after year after year. So don't save them. The stuff that you've got in the back of the garage from the 80s, it's time. You need to put them in the cardboard box to go to the waste management center, it's, it, their life is over. If the bag of ammonium sulfate is harder than a concrete block, <laughs> yeah, not gonna get that into fertilizer format ever again, take it away. Come on, keep them in the original container, as we said, do not decant and, and put them in some other container. If they're locked up in your little uh, pesticide locker, then snails can't eat the labels off and you don't have to worry about it. Store in secure, dark, dry locations. Just basic, this is what you do in the pantry. It's secure and it's dark and it's dry. It's the safest place. Keep it away from the kids and the pets. Don't recommend a chemical that is restricted especially if you live in California. You two guys are exempt, so don't listen to this part. Uh, California has a very strict EPA regulation body and a lot of stuff that you read about in our ARS magazine, and you get flyers from Rosemania and primary products and places like that, and ads come in the newspaper, et cetera. You cannot buy in California legally. And since you can't buy them here legally, you cannot recommend them. So if your friend in Nashville tells you that Mancozeb is the bomb and you will never get fungus on your roses again if you use Mancozeb, have you ever seen it on the shelf at a big box store? No, and you won't because you can't get it in California legally. That's the way it is, and the reason it's that way, California's agriculture feeds our nation. And if they let anything in that's going to upset big ag, California is in trouble, even worse than our water shortage, where we're telling the farmers, no, you're not going to have any water. You may as well let your crops die. Food prices are going to go sky high. Yes, Hell no. They'll take your money and run. They'll ship it anyway, even though it's against the law. It should be illegal, but are there any internet police that you know of? Mm -mm, there aren't. No, it's up to you. It's up to you to know better. And what I generally say is, if you go to one of your big box stores, the plain vanilla, I mean, you know, Walmart, Kmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, those kind of big box stores, they've just got the common denominator stuff, nothing exotic. If you can't find what you're looking for there, you saw the ad for superb fungal control, and you know that's really worked well in Maine, and you want some. If you can't find it at Lowe's, or your local garden center, it's not legal in California. That's just the way it is. Because those garden centers will sell you anything they possibly can, but they can't sell you that. So that's why it's not there. I mean, that's the easiest way to figure it out. Yes?
laws, and these chemical companies know that. So they're protecting themselves by putting the least amount and least lethal stuff in these bottles uh, so that they don't get lawsuits. Rose has, has told you the truth. We're all dumber than sticks, and we're liable to kill ourselves with this stuff. So the big chemical companies don't put a lot of it in the boxes and bottles. And they try to keep it out of our hands because lawsuits go both ways. It's true. People don't think. The general public is worse than gardeners. Gardeners at least are trying to learn. OK. Don't split the uh, chemicals. Don't share it. And wear proper protection. Now, what is proper protection? We'll find out. Uh, Baldo gave me this to show you what a proper storage locker looks like. This steel case with double locks and danger in both English and Spanish. That's Baldo's. <laughs> Over here is a faked up bottle. Supposedly, we're sharing Dacanil Ultrex. There's no such thing as Ultrex with somebody. And we wrote down what we remember of how much to use, but it doesn't say how often or anything like that. Don't do that. It's not in the original container, and that's not the original label. OK. If you're mixing, read the label every single time. Suit up. Wear your protective clothes, including chemical resistant gloves. People will tell you wear rubber gloves. Not rubber, chemical resistant gloves. There are some of these chemicals that will eat right through rubber, especially if it's real rubber. I mean, rubber from rubber trees, not manufactured. So. Does that mean nitrile? No, it doesn't mean nitrile. Nitrile's not rubber. OK, hang on. We're going to get to that. OK, mix only as much as you need. Don't mix several gallons of it if you're only going to spray one and a half gallons. Figure it out. You're all big girls and big boys. You at least got through eighth grade. Most, yeah, you all got through eighth grade. So you can figure how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon and how many quarts are in a gallon and do the math and figure it out. If you're only going to spray a gallon and a half, how much do you put in the water, OK? Avoid mixing more than one chemical unless the label says you can put something else in there. Ortho is the only company I know of that will tell you on the label, this is OK to use with that. I don't know of any other company that will do that, but Ortho does. Mix in a well-ventilated area so that you don't breathe the fumes, or the powder doesn't puff up on yourself. Or, I, you know, it's a wonder I'm still alive. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I was carrying a bucket. Now, this was just with potting soil, OK? But it wasn't new potting soil. It was old potting soil that I'd been building up in a co corner. And every time I took something out of a pot and there was still some soil, I'd add it there. So you know, this was no longer clean potting soil. It was really potting soil. And I had it in a five-gallon bucket. And I'm walking along. And I stumble, and I drop it, OK? I'm short, in case people didn't notice the wicked remark from the back of the room earlier. <laughs> so of course, as the bucket hits, oh, woof, it splashed up right past my face, right past these glasses. Uh, I know I got some in my eyes, because my eyes were watering and blinking. And so I went in the house, and I washed my eyes, and I washed all over. And I said words that only the cat heard, and he was appalled. But my face swelled up. My eyes reacted for three to four days. And in fact, I went to a Golden Gate Rose Society meeting with these big, bloody red eyes like I was turning into a werewolf or something. And they all went, you know, <laughs> get away from me. And I don't blame them. But I mean, these things can happen. It can splash back on you. You weren't doing it on purpose, but it happens. So well-ventilated. Be careful. 
Skin contact with the concentrates is especially dangerous. Why? Because it's concentrated. Yeah, more of it can get in. And remember, it's in red. No first aid. What do you have to do if you splash it on your skin? You wash it off. In your eyes, wash it out. In your mouth, wash and barf. Get it out. <coughs> you know that. And don't take anything to make yourself do that. Use this. Okay. This is an MSDS sheet, Material Safety Data Sheet. Every single thing that you can buy at the store to put on your roses has one of these sheets. Manufacturers must supply them, and the store where you're shopping has them in a big scrapbook, way back in the back where you can't find it. But if you ask for it, they will go find it, and you can read the MSDS. It will tell you the very same thing that's on the label, and more detail about the ag situation, and everything you needed to know, including what to wear and how to wear it. And there is a website you can go to that you can get these things if the store says they don't have it. <coughs> While I'm drinking the water, the rest of you can write that down if you want to. Yes, Richard. Yes, you'll get about 15 or 20 sites that you can go to. There's one special one I like because my three favorite universities uh, together set it up and put it together. And it's uh, lodged at Oregon on their server. Okay. It's uh, npic.orst.edu slash I-N-G-R-E-D slash P-R-O-D-D-A-T-A -D -D -A -A dot H-T-M-L. <laughs> However, you could just go to N-P-I-C dot org and it'll come up. Oregon State. Yeah. Um, this is a commonly used chemical by most of you. Got a, it's got a, a signal word on it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just caution, it's warning. And you use it liberally. As I said up at the beginning of the lecture, everything is chemicals. You need to know what you're dealing with. But it also has all of the ingredients on the label, who manufactured, keep it out of reach of children and pets, all the details, uh, wear your gloves, blah, blah, blah. I mean, they are conforming to the letter of the law. Okay, when searching for a product label or the MSDS, uh, there can be several versions of each product label, depending on the formulation and who manufactures it. Okay, you are legally responsible for following the label directions on the product that you purchased not on what is on a website, not on what might be on an MSDS. You are responsible for what is on the label. <coughs> States can add restrictions like California has. There has to be specific information in the hazard communication standards set forth by OSHA if you have an MSDS, but that won't be on the label. Only what's on the label. That's what you are responsible for. Okay, personal protection when you're spraying. If you're going to spray anything, anything, even baking soda and water, which some of you use, or baking soda and oil and water, which some of you use, or vodka and soap in water, which some of you use. Yeah, it changes the pH of the leaf. It's a way to use up cheap vodka. You know the stuff your brother-in-law gives you. Okay. This is going to be hard to see. Uh, John, I'm walking out of frame. The fellow is wearing a cap. He has safety glasses on. He's wearing what is called a respirator, 
with two uh, filters, one on each side. That screens out very fine particles, whether they're solids or liquids or atomized, almost gases. You can really get serious if you're working in an industry where there's poison gas, and you can get filters that will screen that out too, but we're not that far along in gardening, I'm sure. So he's got a long-sleeved shirt so that all of the skin is not exposed. He's got long pants so all of that skin is not exposed, and they're heavy. It's not, they're not thin, okay? He's wearing hard shoes. No toes hanging out of sandals, no tennis shoes, thin canvas, no barefoot with red fingernail polish, no. I used to have a picture of, I can't tell you who it was, <laughs> never mind, and she was spraying in her yard, yeah. Okay, so he's got his little setup and he's ready to go. He's got gloves on and they look like nitrile, which is supposedly impermeable. She's not looking at me. Is she asleep? <laughs> nitrile. He's wearing nitrile gloves. Okay. Because very, 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 very small molecules can go through nitrile, not big ones. I wouldn't trust them. They are not chemical resistant, but they're liquid resistant in the main. Okay? In the main. This is even better. Still got the hat, safety glasses, and the respirator, but now he's got a full Tyvek suit. What is that? You go to Home Depot or uh, any paint store, and for about $7.95, you can get a tough paper suit that zips all the way up, has sleeves all the way down, pant legs all the way down, and it's impervious to things going through it. You get a little hot inside of it. And they're huge. And they're huge. Mm -hmm. Especially for a lady to get them, you, the small one, you're going to swim in it. But nothing is going to go through it. So it will protect you and your clothes. And it's good for three or four wearings, and then you take it away. You know, it's gone. Okay. He's got chemical-resistant gloves on this time and chemical-resistant black boots. That's the ultimate. You should throw it away every time you use it, but if you're too damn cheap, you just keep using it, you know. You can argue with yourself and say, this is what I really should do it, but. Would you need to dispose of the uh, Tyvek um, outfit, like with your chemicals? If you were yes, yes. Uh, when I take mine off, I peel it off like a cocoon is going off, and uh, the bad part is rolled inside of it. It's rolled very tightly. I put it in a brown paper bag and I put it in the box with the old paint cans and the motor oil and the chemical bottles and stuff and it'll go down to my hazardous waste place. So if you spray, identify the problem that you're going to uh, deal with. Make sure you get the right product. No use trying to spray everything that looks like a caterpillar with caterpillar color, killer, especially if it's just mimicking being a caterpillar and it's not a caterpillar. If it's a fly maggot, you're not going to kill it. Ooh. Okay. Uh, water your roses before you spray. Water the day before and water them well so that they've sucked up as much moisture as possible because you know your roses are always thirsty and they will lie to you and say, okay, you're going to spray. I won't drink that, but they will. They'll just try to suck it up just like they do water. You don't want them to suck it up. You want it to come in slowly so it does its job. Mm -hmm. Protect your children and pets. Don't let them go out there while the stuff is wet. Keep the cat and dog inside. Uh, Send the kids on a play date or put them down to watch TV or whatever it takes or one parent... Take some shopping. Don't let the kids run around in this stuff. Even if you're just spraying with baking soda and water, don't let them get the habit of 
laughing off the danger of being around stuff like this because you don't know what the guy across the street and down two houses will be spraying and they might want to go over and visit. So don't, don't even get them started. Okay, do not spray on a windy day because it's going to go all over and it will come back on you. You'll breathe it, you'll eat it, and it'll get on your skin. Don't spray on a hot day. We all know uh, what stir-fried means. And leaves on a hot day when chemicals hit them, especially with oils, stir-fried leaves. No, don't do that. Best way to cover if you're going to spray anything, start at the bottom and go up so the undersides of the leaves get completely coated and then come back down so the top sides get completely coated and you've sprayed until it's dripping off. Most of what we use, most of what we're allowed to use is not going to be inimical to the critters in your soil. If it falls on the top of your rose bed, on the mulch, or etc., it will deteriorate naturally, and some of it actually turns into nutrients, especially if you're using copper or sulfur. Those are essential to rose nutrition. Dispose of your unused solution properly. Don't pour it down the drain, whatever you do, and don't put it like on the driveway where it can then rain down the drain. Put it on the lawn, put it uh, down a hole in the backyard, or save it in a jug and it's going to go to hazardous waste. But you can spray it on your lawn, you can spray it on other bushes, especially when you rinse your sprayer, you're cleaning your equipment. All of that stuff needs to be disposed of properly too. And it's easiest if you just use it up on your own yard. And if you can't do that, put it in a jug to go to the hazardous waste place. Okay, wash your hands and your face immediately after you're through spraying. Clean up your sprayer, go in the house, wash your hands and face. Then come back out, put everything away, then go back in the house, take all your clothes off. Don't take them off outside. Go in your house, take all your clothes off, and take a shower. So get any remaining anything out of your hair and off of your face and skin, okay? Then put the clothes in the washer and do a small load. Wash them. I know, that's not any fun, is it? No. It's better to go raging down the street, you know. Yeah. All right. Okay. Be a good neighbor, as was pointed out. Let your neighbor know what you're doing if you're going to wear that Tyvek suit. If you're going to put the respirator on with the goggles and the headgear, let the neighbor know what you're doing, you know, because you're going to be out there early in the morning. Lurking. Lurking in the bushes, yes. <laughs> so be a good neighbor. Just let them know I'm putting this stuff on so that I don't get it all over myself. It's easier to clean up that way. It's not going to hurt you. I'm not putting it on your yard. Everything is going to be cool. It's when you don't tell them what you're doing that they get real suspicious. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying dispose of these properly, put them in a container, put them away, go to the hazardous waste. Every town in California, every county, has to have a hazardous waste disposal place. Mostly towns and cities have them, but out in the country, I guess they've got them too. You can look it up. You can call uh, the, the city clerk's office and ask where it is if you can't figure out how to look it up. You get a little brochure from Waste Management if you're on their system every year and it gives you the address of the one in your town. They will take this stuff. They do not charge for that service. That's part of what they do. So you take that cardboard box with the paint cans that you no longer are going to use that shade of paint and the batteries that you need to get rid of and the spray cans you need to get rid of and, I mean, these kind of spray cans and fluorescent lighting bulbs and tubes because you're not supposed to put those in your recycles and take them down to hazardous waste and they'll take care of it. Uh -huh.
Okay. Yeah, you're probably not going to go over your limit, but they don't like. Yeah, you could. Uh, you could have your neighbor take the other ones down. <laughs> what, they're, what they're trying to limit is the scavengers, you know, the guys that go through your garbage when you're not looking and take everything out. They like to take that stuff and try to sell it back to the hazardous waste people, so they're trying to get rid of that too. Um, just a few... Yes, batteries are not supposed to touch each other. When you, buy, when you buy batteries, if you buy a package of them, say you go to Costco and there's 79 dozen in one package, they're all pointing in the same direction and the terminals are not touching each other. He makes the point, if you're disposing of them, cover those terminals with a piece of tape, uh, masking tape, duct tape, anything so that they won't touch each other when you put them in the bag or the box because they will explode. They can, not necessarily will, but they're just waiting. You know, there's a little bit of charge left in them. Yeah, trust nothing. Okay, just leaving you with a few tips. If you're going to spray, more is not better. Okay? Read the label, only use the amount you're supposed to. More is not better, and more frequently is not better. Do exactly what the label says. If you put more on, the pest you're trying to control isn't going to die any faster. The, uh, you're going to waste the pesticide, you're going to waste money. You can actually cause damage to the plant by putting too much product on it, just like too much product on your hair can really look tacky. And you can contaminate the environment. Too much is too much. Okay, the lady needs to use Roundup or some other herbicide because she's got an invasion of wild grasses. But she understands it's not good to use it around roses. Yeah, don't use it around roses. You can, if you absolutely have to use this stuff, you can make a cone, you know, the cone of silence or the cone of shame that the dog has to wear, <laughs> that kind of a cone around the nozzle of your sprayer, and put the cone over the clump of weeds, and then spray and wait, count, 15, 20, 25, 30, 30 seconds should allow it to adhere either to the weed or the sides of the cone. You're still taking a chance, and you can back off and go to the next clump. It's, it's dumb and slow, but that's about the only thing I can think of you can do. It'll drift in the air, but remember, uh, along with all of the horror stories about Roundup, as far as people are concerned, you can rub it all over your body. You can drink it. It is the most effective weed killer we have ever invented. It's just too bad for us that our favorite flower is so sensitive to it. Grass Be Gone is a good one. Jan, did you hear that? And for crabgrass, uh, Ortho makes a crabgrass killer. It will not kill a uh, bluegrass or, or broadleaf plants. And in fact, I had a bad crabgrass invasion in a bed of miniatures many years ago, and I sprayed the hell out of them with crabgrass killer. It's very oily, too. And of course, the roses dropped every leaf they had. The crabgrass died. The roses put out new leaves that were absolutely black spot free. And they haven't had much black spots since. They don't dare. They're afraid. It did not kill the roses, but I haven't seen the crabgrass come back. They, they tell you that that crabgrass killer that they make translocates through the crabgrass down into those underground runners. And you know, real crabgrass, not only, that's good, goes sideways with the stolens, 
it can go 12 feet down. That's why when you pull it all out and you meticulously rake your beds and you make it so nice and you think at last, and it's not at last, that comes back. Yeah. Ortho, crabgrass killer. Ortho. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? I hope you do really well on the next CR test. <laughs> Thank you for staying.